Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Make sure I'm on there. Okay. Good to see you this morning. Those that are here physically, those that are watching online, just glad that you're able to come and, and be a part of what we're doing. How many people enjoyed worship this morning? Amen. You know, sometimes we forget uh, the amount of work involved. You know, for you to see what you see and experience what you experience, that means another night was set aside, plus other times of preparation uh, of those people who are leading and worshiping and being a part of the music teams. And we have here right now four different music teams, and they all work very hard. Uh, can we just give uh, just a little thanks to all the music teams that do all that they do? Amen. You know, we, we appreciate you bringing us into the presence of the Lord to prepare our hearts for what God has for us. Amen. And so a couple of weeks ago at our outdoor service, I, I had the theme, Jesus is our light. You know, I, it, it was bright outside, sunshiny kind of day, and I thought it was applicable. So we're just talking about Jesus being a light. And as part of it, we went to the book of Judges, and we, we talked a little bit about the story of Gideon and how he defeated the enemy, and he had torches inside of clay pots, and he broke the, the clay pots, and the light shone, and it freaked out all the enemy, and they all beat up each other and killed one another, and the enemy was defeated. And as that message was happening, uh, the Lord just spoke a word to my heart and said, you're a cracked pot, you know, and so I said that, you know, everyone kind of chuckled about it, and we, we moved on, but I couldn't shake it, and so what happened is last week, you know, with that theme in mind, I talked about the fact that we are all cracked pots, you know, and, and we talked a little bit about that, and, and I just want to, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, I want you to realize something, God didn't make you a cracked pot. This is really, really important because so many times we will stand and say, God, why did you make me this way? In fact, let me just do a survey. Has anyone here ever said that? Just out loud maybe or in your heart. God, why did you do this? Why did you make me this way? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. And so here's the thing. God didn't make you that way. He didn't make you broken or cracked. God made you perfect. And you can read about it in Jeremiah 18 where, where God took Jeremiah down to the potter's house and, and used the example of, of, of a real pottery maker showing how it was a pot was made. And even if it got marred when the, the potter was making it, he'd make it into something more beautiful again. In other words, there was never anything cracked or broken that that, that pottery maker made. It was perfect. And when you were born, birthed into this world, let me say something to you. You were perfect. And then life happened. And then life happened. You know what I'm saying? You know, whether physically or, or, or emotionally, you got dropped on your head a few times, all right? And so that affected you, all right? You know, it either physically hurt you and cracked you up, broke you up, or, or emotionally you were broken. In other words, your parents, as good or bad as they were, they did what they did, so that caused different fractures and different things to happen in your life. Then, oh, by the way, you go to school, and stuff happens there or doesn't happen there, right? And then life happens, different experiences. All kinds of things happen in life that causes fragments and breaking and brokenness to happen in our lives. And about that point, uh, we say, God, why did you make me this way? And here's the thing. We, in saying that, put God as an adversary against us. Can I tell you, you don't want God on the other side of the fence. You want him on your side. And so please, I encourage you, if you're still kind of saying that, you know, God, why did you do this? God, why did you do that? Let me tell you something. Anything bad in your life, God did not do. All right? Just get that settled. So don't keep blaming God for the brokenness in your life. He's the one that wants to help you. And in fact, with that in mind, I want to show you kind of our, our foundation scripture that I want to kind of launch out from. And it's from Psalms 147, verse 3. And it says this, that God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Now, just look at that. Does it say God heals some people who are broken and heals, binds up some of their wounds? doesn't say that at all. This is a statement that is what? All-inclusive. God's heart is to heal anyone who's brokenhearted. And anyone who has wounds, he wants to bind them up. Now, this is a very interesting scripture because it has two parts to it, right? healing broken hearts, and binding up the wounds. And as I began to look at it, I realized that, that here's what it's speaking of. The healing of the broken heart is it's talking about the internal part. You know, your, your soul, your way of thinking, all the, all the stuff that's on the inside. And the outside, binding up wounds, actually speaking of the outside part. You know, the physical part, what, what comes out, so to speak. But what comes first, the outside or the inside? The inside. This is something that you and I have to deal with. Because when we go to God, often we're saying, God, fix this. I've got this problem. 
you know, I'm doing this, or, or this person has done this to me. And, and we're, we're always looking kind of at the outside, right? The, I'll call it this, the superficial. But what does God want to do first before he deals with the outside wounds? In fact, what does he have to do first before he can deal with the outside wounds? He's got to heal your broken heart. He's got to make you whole on the inside. And after making you whole on the inside, then he can work on the external things. But what do we want? We want the external first. So here's what we say. God, fix this, but I don't want to change. Now, we don't say that. None of you say it. I don't say that. But that's really what we're saying when we say, God, just fix whatever this issue is in my life. But let me tell you something. With God, he always wants to go to the root of whatever the issue is. You see, the brokenness in your life is not external. It doesn't begin there. It began with something internal. You hear what I'm saying? So, so important. And so as we begin to explore this today, well, let me just, I have this in my notes and it's important. Last week we talked about a Japanese pottery repair. How many people heard that message and talked about it? So about half of you. So let me just take a minute and talk about this. It's called kintsugi. I am not pronouncing it properly, all right? You can bring a picture of the pot up. But what this is, is basically a form of pottery repair that if the pot breaks, they put it back together again. It, it's the most amazing thing. But there's some things that uh, you need to know about this. That First of all, the, the material they use to put it together, they use a sap from a tree that only grows in Japan. It's only in Japan. And actually, for that tree to give up its sap, the tree has to die. It's interesting, right? It's not like a tree where you can, like a rubber plant tree where you can just take the, the stuff from it and it keeps growing. It actually, the tree dies as a result of giving up its sap. Now, I just want to stop there. There's such an, a picture there, for me anyways, that I see Jesus hanging on the cross, giving his life fully so that we could have everlasting life. Let me tell you something. Just as that, that tree, that sap tree, had to give up its sap to heal this pot, Jesus gave up his life so that we might receive healing in our vessel, in who we are, amen? That's amazing, what a picture, right? And so this pot, now here's the other thing. It, it, it's not like super glue. Super glue's awesome. How many people use super glue? How many people have glued their fingers together or glued parts of their, and it like takes a long time for it to, you know, come apart. I remember when it first came out, we, we did all kinds of things to people. Anyway, we're not going to get into that. But, but it was fun, all right? But the, the thing is, that's not how this is. When they put this resin in, it literally takes months for it to harden. And so there's a process involved. And it's the same for you and I. How many people would love a super glue fix? Right? You know, I got a crack. Jesus just fix it, puts the glue in. Okay, you're good to go. Well, that's not the way it is in real life, is it? There's a process involved for that healing to happen. And so the final part of the process is in the last part of the resin they put on. They put on in layers. The last part is in, in traditional kintsugi, they take powdered gold and mix it with the resin and put it into the crack. Now, for you and I, if we had a cracked pot, let's say it was cracked on one side, right? We super glue it, and then what do we do with that pot if it's on display? We turn it around <laughs> so the crack's facing the wall, right? Nobody can see it, right? But in this case, it's actually glorified, literally. It, they, they actually say, look at this. This was broken, and here's the lines to show where it was repaired. That's God's heart for you and I as well. That those things that we feel ashamed of, those things that we were once broken in, that we were damaged goods beyond repair, that once we're repaired, that it's not something we continue to hide, but actually becomes part of our testimony, part of our victory uh, speech, so to speak, to say, this is what God has done in my life. See this crack? I was once this, but now I'm this because of him. God wants to pour liquid gold into every crack of your life. That's what he wants to do, so that it will no longer be the broken part, but actually be the strongest part of your life. Can you say amen to that? Because I'm going to tell you something, and just everybody just keep looking at me, we're all cracked pots. And you say, I said all, oh, that's me too. We're all cracked pots. We all have damaged areas in our life, and, and listen, the, the, most, the worst part of the damage we had was this, was that we were separated from God because of sin. And the first crack that we have to let the Lord fix is to bring us back into restoration to the Father. And I pray that every single person here, every person watching has made that decision to do that. But if you haven't, 
it begins there. God can't fix the other cracks. He can't fix the other brokenness until that primary crack, that separation from him to you is repaired. So let's just take a moment, just every head bowed. Lord, if there's anyone here within the sound of my voice, whether physically here or online, hearing this message, and and they're like, well, I've never made a commitment to Jesus. I've never accepted him into my heart that this is the time for you to do this. And so right at this very moment, I just encourage you to say this, and let's just say this together. And and if you're here and, and you've never accepted Jesus, when you say this prayer and mean it with your heart, you can become born again, and that crack can begin to be repaired. So just say this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm broken, and I'm separated from you. I need you. Please come into my life right now and begin that healing of restoration back to you. And I know now that you have a place in heaven for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you made that decision for the first time, come and let me know, all right? But here's the thing, it all begins with that decision. Now, you might say, well, hold it then. As as our pots get repaired more and more, then God must love me more. Doesn't work that way. Do you know that the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us? That, that God loved us already. So listen, this whole thing of getting repaired, of getting fixed, isn't about like, see God, look at what I'm doing. It's not about that at all. It's just as you become more whole in him, you can be a vessel that he can use for his kingdom. That's what it's about. But God doesn't love you any different. You get what I'm saying? He loves you complete right now at this moment in time. And so just be assured of that. This isn't about, you know, being better than someone else. It's just letting God work in your life. Amen? Okay, so (laughs) how do we know where these broken or cracked areas are? You know, really, this is, in a sense, is very practical this morning. How do we know? I think, you know, when we talk about it kind of figuratively and say, you know, we're all cracked pots, everyone says, oh, yeah, yeah, I got broken areas. But how do we know what's really broken and what really isn't broken? My wife tells me. <laughs> yeah, so Norman, yeah, yeah, that, often uh, that can happen. Those nearest and dearest to you will tell you what is broken, and Norman has made a good point. But really, often what they're describing is the external, right? The wound, the external part. But really, what I'm talking about, how do you know about the inside part, the part that really needs to be fixed, where most people don't see? And only God can do that, right? So I'm going to tell a story, and then I'll, I'll, you'll understand where I went with this story. Back when I was still dating Sandra, so we're, we're going back like 40, 40 years probably. That's scary. That's scary. My Lord. Anyways, 40 years ago. So I was at her parents' house, and, and I was outside doing something. It was in the summer, a hot day, you know, a day like today. And I came in, and they offered me a, a glass of water. Now, that's not unusual, But there was like four or five of them just like standing around. That was unusual, all right? And so, you know, I I, I was a little concerned about what was going to happen or what was going on. But, you know, they offered me water. I looked at the cup. The water looked clean inside. Didn't look like they'd spit in it or anything. So I'm like, okay, you know. And so so I I take a drink, you know, and all of a sudden I look at the front of my shirt and there's water on it. I'm like, what's that? So then I take another sip, like, and more water. And they're looking at me saying, well, can't you drink water even? Like, you know, because they just tormented me back in those days, all right? And and they're all laughing. I'm like, okay, what's going on? And I I, I looked at the cup because it wasn't just a a glass. It was a cup, uh, like a mug. And it had all kind of prints on the outside. It had a thick lip around the outside. I get looking at this thing, and it turned out there was these little holes all the way around the lip, below the lip, about three quarters of an inch. So it didn't matter where you took a drink, you were going to get doused, all right? And it was, it was a gag thing, all right? So they were just like, oh, you can't even drink a glass of water. And I'm like, so I, anyway, I, don't, I won't tell you what I said, okay? Back, <laughs> I was not happy, all right? But the point is that what was in the cup came out of the cup because of where it had a hole, where it was broken. Now, that's exactly the same for you and I. When you're squeezed, what comes out? Think about a toothpaste tube. What comes out of a toothpaste tube when you squeeze it? Toothpaste, right? That's a good thing. Well, what comes out of you when the pressures of life come along and you're squeezed? And so in a sense, 
That's how you know whether you have cracks or broken or holes or issues in your life is that when squeezing happens, what comes out of you? And so that sounds okay. And I'm like, well, Lord, okay, I, I need to have a, a better understanding of, of what can I compare that to? In other words, great, what comes out of me? There's a few things I can say, oh, yeah, that's not good. But how can we literally have a, a litmus test, you know, a template, so to speak, that we can put up against our life in any area and say, broken, not broken, you know, healed, not healed. And so the Lord just gave me a word. He just gave me a scripture. Let me share the scripture with you, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22, in the start of 23, it says this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Those are the nine fruits of the Spirit. And so, what would be opposite of love? Hate, right? Uh, what would be opposite of joy? Sadness or depression, right? What about peace? You know, war, turmoil, frustration, right? So you could see that you could look at every one of those words that's a positive word here, you know, really exemplifying the, the spirit of God, and it, you could see a negative connotation. You could go a different way with it. Well, here's the thing. When you're squeezed... What comes out? Those nine fruits or other stuff? Let's just say that. And literally, there's your litmus test right there. When, when something happens to you, when the pressures of life happen, when your house is on fire, either figuratively or literally, you know, what are you saying? What's coming out of your mouth? Is, is it one of those fruits or something other than that? And if it's the other than that, that's a broken place in your life. That, that's literally the way you can define it. Isn't that really cool to be able to say, okay, this is broken, this is not broken. There's our litmus test right there. Is it when we're squeezed, is the presence of Jesus coming out? Because we have the Holy Spirit in us, that's what's supposed to come out. Or is it part of our old way of thinking, our old attitudes, our old actions? You know, back in the day, I was what was known as a hothead. How many people have hotheads in their life? That means that, look at you're, 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 something happens and right away, anger just flares up. And I was one of those kind of guys. I just could get mad, turn of a dime. Just something said, something's done. I just get angry immediately. And so for me, that was one of my cracks, one of my flaws in my life. And so what happened is, as time went on, I realized this isn't right. And I had to surrender that to the Lord. Now, I can't tell you that I am a, a completely converted person in the area of anger, but I'll tell you something. It takes a lot more to get my goat now. Yeah. In fact, every once in a while, Sandra likes to push buttons. And she knows what buttons to push just to get me. And she, and, and she tells me at the end, I'm just testing you. Make sure Jesus is in there. <laughs> Listen, I don't suggest you do that to your spouses, all right? Because you might not like what gets squeezed out, all right? You might. But as time has gone on, that's been an area where I've allowed the Lord to begin to allow his resin, you know, his love, his blood, his gold to flow into and change me. And so there's a process involved. Uh, in fact, I don't know whether I mentioned this, that, that when those pots are, are made and repaired, it takes about three months or longer for everything to harden. So there's a process involved. So God shows me, hey, you're an angry guy. You need to stop that. All right. Well, I wish that he could, you know, just like go bloop and you're fixed. But that's not what happened, right? It's okay. So then, what? So what do you think? He takes all the things away that would make me angry? No, he actually brings more things. And you're like, well, that's counterproductive, right? No, it's not. That's the testings, so that now I can go into that and with a consciousness of the Holy Spirit, say, look at, okay, I normally get angry at this. I feel myself getting angry. Lord, can you help me with this? And boof, able to deal with it. And then another test, and another. Then after a while, it's a non-issue anymore. That's how God works. So if you're praying, God, I don't want this to happen anymore because I act this way, you're actually praying against Scripture. God wants to bring us through the trials. He wants to bring us through the fire to purify us, to bring us out the other side better than we were before. I think that's why the Japanese use gold, right? You know, you can put that through the fire and the gold is still going to be there. And it's the same for you and I, amen? Okay, so here's, here's what I want to do. In our remaining time, our, our few minutes together, I want to give you four really simple steps of, of a, what I call a pathway to restoration. In other words, this is super practical. In other words, we've kind of been talking about, okay, we're cracked, we need Jesus to help us. You know, 
I want to give you four tangible steps that if you take these, it will help you. Now, I wish I could tell you, you take these four steps and you're good and, gone, good and done. No. You take these steps today. And then guess what? Tomorrow, there's a little fracture over here. You take those steps. You, you, there's a process involved. This is an ongoing event in your life. If you want more of Jesus, this is what you need to do. If you want more healing, this is what you need to do. You want more restoration, these are the steps you need to do. Really simple, but not always easy. Now, the first step I mentioned last week, and some people yelled it out at the first service. They remembered, uh, but let me just tell you what the first step is. You've got to own it. You've got to admit, I got a crack. I got a problem. Because unless you're willing to do that, even God can't help you. You've got to own this thing. And right away, I know some of you are thinking, but hold it, they caused the crack. He caused the crack. She caused the crack. That may be, but you're the one that's fractured and broken. And you're the one that needs help right now. So listen, put them aside. And we're going to do a whole thing on forgiveness somewhere down the road. That, that's a whole subject in itself, all right? But, but here's what I want to talk to you about now. I want to talk about you and me. In other words, I'm not talking about fixing someone else. I'm talking about what you need to do to be restored and made whole. And it begins with owning it, admitting you've got a problem. Now, you're not going to like the scripture I'm going to put with this. So don't get your back up until I explain it, okay? So here it is. You've got to own it. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And right away, some of you are saying, I didn't sin. They sinned. I feel your pain. But listen, the word sin, you know what it means? It means to miss the mark of perfection. Sometimes we think, you know, sin is, is something else other than that. It means to miss the mark of perfection. So when you have a crack in your life, when you're fragmented, you have brokenness in your life, guess what? You're not perfect. You're not perfect. And so you want to be perfect. You want to be complete. And so what do you do? You confess the issue to God. Okay, I'm not talking about blaming anybody at this point. You're just owning it. You're admitting you've got the problem. You're fractured. And now what you're doing is, is, is saying, God, I'm coming to you. I'm confessing this before you. All right? So listen to me. I'm going to say something, and some of you aren't going to like what I'm... I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not. All right? You know what? If you keep just blaming the other person for whatever that broken part is in your life, you will never be able to move forward. You can't. Now, I, I, you know, I, I wish that God could show up with an angel and you can explain, bring your case to him, say, look, this person did this to me. Can you go, like, torch them for me? And the angel goes, yes, I'll look after this. Yeah. It, it, let me tell you something. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. God wants to help you. He wants to bring healing and wholeness to you. And for that to happen, it's between you and Jesus. There's no third parties involved. Between you and Jesus. Amen? So you got to own it. That's the start. And we mentioned this last week. And so now we go into some new territory. Here's the next step, number two. You need to be willing to ask for help. Hebrews 4, verse 16. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See, it's one thing to own it. It's the next thing to ask for help. Some of us are kind of still a little prideful. It's like, God, I got this. Yeah, I got a crack. Here, I'm owning it. I got, I got this. I got this crack. But Lord, I got this. I'll, I'll look after it. You can't. You can't. This is beyond your ability. Now, you could change some behavior, some superficial stuff. Again, you, could, you need to see that the cracks in your life is like a gunshot wound. And if you try to fix it, you're just putting a Band-Aid. Now, that covers the hole, right? But you got a bullet inside of you. Guess what? You need ma major surgery to have that dealt with. A Band-Aid is not going to do it. And so when we say, God, I, owe, I own this. I admit I got this problem, but I don't need your help. Literally, that's what you're doing. You're trying to put Band-Aids on wounds that are in your body as a part of your life that you can't fix. So step two is that you've got to ask for help. And I love this scripture, right? It says, look, you can draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Here's the problem. You think because you're broken, because you're fractured, you got issues, you have no right to talk to God about it. No, you have every right as a child of God, broken or not. Remember I said God loves you the moment you were born into this world. He loved you. And when you accept Christ, he still loves you exactly the same. When you repent of your sins, he still loves you exactly the same. Why? Because he gave it all to you. 
But here's what happens. As we surrender to him, we begin to experience that love coming back on us. Amen? So as we look at this, here's the thing. You're broken? Go to the pottery guy that can fix you. Go to the one that made you in the first place. Go back to the manufacturer. Doesn't that make sense? Listen, if you had a brand new car and the thing started running really badly and it was a month old, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, oh, I guess this is the way it is, you know? No way. You're like, I paid for a stinking warranty. I paid thousands of dollars for this car. Somebody's going to deal with this, right? And you're going to go straight back to the dealer and say, fix this, right? Well, here's the thing. Your manufacturer has a lifetime guarantee on you. Hallelujah. Lifetime. Not this, not, no fine print. You know, none of that, oh, you got to pay half. The other. None of that lifetime warranty with your manufacturer. So if you're broken, what do you do? Go back to the manufacturer. And that's what this says, that you can go and find grace. That's getting something that you don't deserve. You know, because you're not perfect. You've missed the mark, right? All those different things. But going to find grace for help in your time of need. He wants to help you and bring restoration to you. Amen? Okay, so you got to own it. Be willing to ask for help. Okay, this third one is a big deal. You need to realize that this is happening in your life. All right? Be on guard of your adversary. 1 Peter 5, beginning of verse 6. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So just look at this for a minute. This is kind of a, a positioning of ourselves. In dealing with the enemy, we cannot allow pride to rule over us. And literally, God is saying, look, you need to be in a place of humility. And what that means is, it doesn't mean your head bent over and, and not talking or anything. That's not humble in God's sight. Humble just means submitted to Jesus. That's what it means. And God will help you, even to the point of, look, as, as you have that right attitude, he'll lift you up, he'll help you in circumstances, but also you need to cast your anxieties on him. Cast all the things that choke you out. Why? Because he cares for you. Now let's carry on and just read what happens now. So that sets the stage. So now in verse 8, says this, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So here you have an enemy, his name is Satan, the devil, who really wants to leave you broken. He doesn't want you to get fixed. Why? Because if you get fixed, guess what? You're going to start telling other people about how God fixes people. And the thing is, as long as you remain broken and downtrodden and feeling shame and guilt, you're not telling anybody about Jesus. Because you're like, well, God, if you can't help me, you're not going to help anybody else. And that's literally what the devil wants to do to you bust you down, beat you down, and put you in a place where you're ineffective for e even in your own life, but for those around you. But as we surrender to the Lord, as we own it, as we come and ask for help and realize that the devil is trying to stop us, that God will strengthen us. And in fact, the next verse, which we actually talked about last week, but it's in context, verse 10. And after you've suffered a little while, in other words, after you've dealt with some fragmenting in your life, right? The God of grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will do what? Restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That's what God wants to do. In other words, Satan wants to do, he has his agenda. He's a schemer. He wants to break you down and bust you up. But God, as you continue to go through and walk with him, as you own it, right? As you ask for help, and God will restore you. But just recognize the enemy wants to stop you. He'll throw, you know, the Bible talks about fiery darts. He'll throw things in your head and say, God can't do that. Who do you think you are to get that from God? He doesn't care about you. How many people have heard words like that? Absolutely. And that's just the enemy just whispering into your ear. And you have to come to a place of recognizing where that's coming from. It's coming from the enemy of your soul and recognize that God wants to restore you and he is for you. And here's what my Bible says and yours should say it too. If God is for me, who can be against me? Amen? So listen, uh, just with Jesus on your side, you, you've got the win here. All right? You've got the win. All right. Now this last step is probably the most difficult of all. You might be thinking, well, hold it. You're making me own it. You're making me ask for help. You're making me realize that the enemy's trying to stop me. You mean this one's harder? Yep, this is the hardest one of all, but without this one, you can't be fixed, all right? This is, this, this is the one you got to do, all right? And here it is. You have to choose to let your master potter perform the repair. 
2 Timothy 2, verses 20 and 21. In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but of wood and clay, some for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy and useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. You know, there's a lot of different, in fact, I studied this out, a lot of different theologians interpret this all different ways, but I'm going to take it this way as, you know, one of them suggested this, and I believe it as well, that those uh, pots of silver and gold just kind of represent the people in the world. They're just people, right? But then as we look at the next verse, we get to choose which one we want to be. So it says, you know, cleanse yourself. You get the idea, well, I've got to get my act together. I have to change. But in the original language, the flavor is this, that you are allowing Jesus to cleanse you, okay? So you are choosing to let that cleansing happen. And so you get to choose to let Jesus heal you. You get to choose to let Jesus bind up those wounds that are in your life. And that's hard. You know why that's the hardest thing? Because that means change has to happen on the inside of you. And that's hard. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty set in my ways. Anybody else set in your ways? You know, you got a certain way you do things. And yeah, you recognize you got some cracks here and there. So you kind of skirt around them, right? You're like, oh yeah, I know that's, a, that's dangerous. I'll, I'll kind of go around. And the thing is, God wants to have you not go around anymore, but to face these cracks and this brokenness and deal with it face to face. And if you're willing to do that, here's what I can promise you. Healing will come your way. He will heal your broken heart. Whatever's going on on the inside. Whatever's caused that brokenness. And then out of that, your wounds will be completely bound up and you will be restored completely. And that area that was once broken will become the strongest place in your life. Let's stand together. You know, last week, essentially at the end, I said, who's willing to own it? Who's willing to admit they're a cracked pot? And most of you put up your hands that we're here and and uh, we, you know, prayed about that and asked, really, we actually went to step two, right, and asked God to help. All right, well, now we got to take it a few more steps. We need to recognize that the enemy wants to stop us. And then we have to come to a place of literally surrendering our crackness, our brokenness to the Lord and say, Lord, whatever is necessary for you to fix me, and again, it's a process. Just like when they're in the Japanese pottery repair, it's months. Listen, for some of the repairs God's done in my life was years. He's still working on some of them. If you know me, you know he is. You know what I'm saying? Just be honest, the ones closest to me, they know about, listen, the ones closest to you know that you're a crack pot. Right, that's the way it is. But are you willing to let God start? And again, it's going to feel uncomfortable maybe at the start. It's going to feel uneasy because it's what? Unfamiliar territory. It means a changing of your thinking, changing of your attitude. I, I get all that, but here's what I can promise you. As a crack pot that God's been working on for some 38 years, I can promise you that every time I said, Lord, I need help, and I let him work on a crack, it was always better after. Always. No exceptions. And I promise you it's the same for you as well. So just with every head bowed, Where are you at in this process? You know, do you recognize that you have some areas that when you're squeezed, stuff comes out that shouldn't come out? And you're at a place where you're like, man, I want Jesus to come out when I'm squeezed in every area of my life. I want, I want all the fruits of the Holy Spirit to come out. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what I want to come out instead of the other stuff. Now, if that's you, just slip your hand up in the air. You're just acknowledging to Jesus. You know, is my hand's up as well. All right, you can put those hands down. Lord, most hands went up here, Lord God. And I'm so grateful for that. They responded to the words you gave me, and I'm grateful for that. But Lord, we're at that place now where we've admitted it. <laughs> we recognize the enemy wants to stop us. We've asked you for help. And now we're at that place where we're surrendering to you. So Lord, right now in Jesus' name, I pray that this can be a moment, a time of surrender. And Lord, not that we surrender now and then go home and close back up again, but that Lord, for that season of time that we need to be fully open to you in these areas, that we submit to you. We submit to our potter. And we know that as your clay that you will treat us and love us and, and, and help us and bring healing and restoration to us. 
we submit to the potter's hand right now. And we thank you, Lord, that you are a good God and you're always good. And you're always about restoration. First of all, back into relationship with you. And then restoration in, in relationships around us. Restoration in, in circumstances and situations. You're all about restoration. And so we submit to you right now. We ask you to begin a work that we will testify in days and weeks and years coming of your goodness. And we'll be able to point to what was once a crack once was a place of brokenness and it will be filled with your gold. And we can say, look at what the Lord has done. Amen. And so we look forward to that day. And Lord, I, I pray that we hear many testimonies as time goes on of you healing and bringing restoration. So Lord, bless each person here. I pray that as they go forth, that this isn't something that just tickled their ears, Lord God, but that it was a message that is a, goes deep into their hearts that you bring it back up to them and you help them in their spiritual journey with you. So bless them and keep them in Jesus' name.